for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Well, my question would be, oh, are you asking Dr. Dan a question or myself? I, I'm asking you the question. Um, let me pull this out real quick. Um, here's what Dr. Jameson himself said in his own paper. Um, the caveat here uh, is whether or not the mutation rate recorded represents a germline rate rather than a somatic rate. Okay. So um, you affirm that that is um, the caveat in the study. So basically, do you, do you agree that if sting is not um, Germline in his paper is invalid. Um, no, because he, uh, the, the mutation rate that Jensen is using an overall faster mutation rate for the mitochondrial DNA. I can hear a lot of typing. It might be coming from Dan's end. Yeah. Um, lines up with Sorry. multiple other pedigree studies. No, that's fine. And the mutation rate lines up with the bigger picture uh, in terms of the number of. DNA differences, number of mutations separating any two people, let's say in terms of mitochondrial DNA, if we're focusing on that. So the numbers that I've found in a number of papers seem to, it, it almost looks like Jensen is going with a more conservative number anyways. Because from what I can tell, the rate in mitochondrial DNA in terms of how fast it, it mutates from generation to generation is about 0.5 per generation, okay? So you're looking at about one on average every other generation, okay? So I don't think that it invalidates it because overall we're still looking at a fast mutation rate. We're looking at very few DNA differences that separate any two people in terms of the mitochondrial DNA. On average, it's like 22. I've got a paper here I'll screen. I think I've got it pulled up, let me see. So, so basically you're saying that Dr. Um, Jameson himself is wrong about his own paper when he says that. When he says that it would. So, so does Dr. G so basically. Yeah. So basically I'll, I'll just. Yeah, read, uh, let me actually reiterate with. Um, this is his own words. Um, he, he said, I know he asked him whether or not it would invalidate the issue. Germline versus somatic, potentially, yes, it might be invalid. If Ding and all use a somatic rate, then the germline rate would be unknown. Uh, this is Dr. Jeans and himself. Do you, you are in disagreeing. Terms of that paper, in terms of that paper, it would be, it would be off if obviously there are somatic cell line mutations that are being calculated. But my point is there's a, there's a number of other pedigree based mutation rate studies where we know the germ cell line rate. And I'm telling you, it's roughly 0 0.5 per generation. So yes, if you're just looking at that one study, but there's a number of independent lines of evidence that suggest 0.5 per generation. So overall, on the macro view of things, the predictions he's made, the numbers he's derived, the arguments he's using, it wouldn't invalidate that. That one specific paper might be off if there's some somatic cell line mutations, because as Ding was saying, that wasn't their goal, was to derive an accurate mutation rate in the germ cell line, right? They admit that, and, and Jensen admitted that as well in, in his paper. That's just one of the papers that he's looked at, right? Um, so basically, in his, well, why don't we do this? Um, standing, um, can you summarize um, James's paper? Can you summarize his methodology for me? His methodology in, in, own, in, in looking at the trio section. The, the, yeah, so the trio in, in your own words, can you in. summarize? How is he using the data specifically from the Ding paper? Yeah, he's and using the their, yeah, yeah. How you is it, well, you said it earlier where he's looking at the trios studies that they say they were not using specifically to come up with a germ cell line mutation rate because there's a good chance there are somatic cell line mutations within that, within those numbers. But Jensen is using that number with the thought that perhaps this is an accurate germ cell line mutation and comparing it with all of the, the number of other 
studies on pedigree rates to see if they corroborate each other. And they seem to corroborate each other in, in what that mutation rate is, whether if it's fast, whether if it's slow, uh, that's the best answer I can give you right now. But this paper here would suggest the mutation rate in the human mitochondrial DNA control region, you can go through this, is roughly 0.5 per generation, which is pretty fast. There's only 22 DNA differences, David, that separate okay. any two people on average. So that, to do the math, that's only going to take roughly 44 generations to accumulate that number of DNA differences which means we can account for a ton of purifying selection because by definition, you know, you are correct in that the observed pedigree rate, the empirical rate is faster than the long-term rate, the substitution rate, because selection will weed out a lot of these new mutations. Most new variants are lost over time, of course. Okay. So, uh, can ahead, I please. ask a question? Sure, go right ahead. SFT, can you show in Jensen's math or anywhere else where anyone using germline, I'm going to put it in quotes because he doesn't quite do it right, but germline mutation rates, where anyone using that methodology to calculate the time to most recent common ancestor, can you show in Jensen's work or anyone else's where they account for selection, drift, bottlenecks, any of that stuff that subsequently uh, reduces the rate at which mutations accumulate over many generations? Can you show that math anywhere? That's a good question. You can find a lot of that in Carter's work. You can find I've that I've gone through in all of Carter's, Sanford's, Jensen's, everybody's. Nobody talks about selection and drift and bottlenecks. They take the per generation. Well, then you're not looking, well, then you're not looking hard enough, Dan, because I've cited in numerous articles. Well, I'm things. asking, but, but. Well, real quick, real, I don't I'm want us to constantly you, talk over I'm that. asking, asking where question, is the question. Hold on. Uh, oh, I'm muting okay. both of you real quick. I'm going to mute both of you real quick, um, one at a time. Um, I'm sorry. I kind of want to uh, make sure everything stays calm and respectful here. Um, so, um, saying the truth, go ahead. I'm going to give you the floor and then Dr. Dean the floor. Okay. So I've screen shared. I've cited a number of articles. Okay. With a lot of papers cited in those articles. I've <laughs> okay, so then gone to the papers themselves to so, show. So Sandy, can I ask you, a, can I ask you a question about the paper that you have up on your screen to nucleic acid research? Um, can you summarize that paper for me? Yes, this is, well, for one, David, I'm not coming on here for an evolutionist test. Uh, right? oh, oh, I know. I understand all this stuff. Okay, I've read through these papers. This, I've had this up to counter a, a number of the critics, including Speed of Sound, okay, that say Dr. Carter is not an expert or he doesn't know anything about mitochondrial DNA in general, and that we don't have the mitochondrial Eve consensus sequence. Well, he goes through here looking at full length mitochondrial DNA sequences, okay? And in this video, this is why I'm not going to play evolutionist test because in that video you're rebutting, I start off the video by explaining this paper, as well as this paper here, uh, I think this is the one, as well as this paper here, where they do just what you're asking and what Dan's asking, where they go over the rate, the average number of differences separating people, the most number of differences separating people, where they go over how much purifying selection would be required, okay, in, in the fact that they point to Let's see, phylogenetic trees in the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA, showing that it's only a couple hundred generations worth of mutations, given the 0.5 per generation, okay? As compared to thousands of generations that Dan always wants to push, we can account for the number of differences, even the max number of differences at about 100, okay? That gives us 100 or more generations to account for purifying selection, okay? You're gonna have to, now, for the specific mathematical details, Dan's just gonna have to go read through these papers. He can read through this paper to see how they came up with the consensus sequence. And there is another, and this one too, right here, the, the Eve consensus sequence, where they go over all the different DNA positions, okay? It's all here. I mean, I'm not gonna sit here and, and give a, a dissertation on all of this when I've already cited these papers a number of times. And here's the thing, this, this is published in, the International Conference on Creationism, but since evolutionists have a problem with that, Dr. Carter is also published in secular journals as well on this exact same thing. So, yeah. 
So here's my question then, since I've asked a couple questions, how do you account for such a small amount? So for example, if I go here, how do you account then, since we have the Eve sequence, we have the numbers, we know the rates per generation, we know that any two people are only separated by a few differences, 22 on average. So how is this thousands of generations worth of, of time? Okay, well, first of all, um, that is, first of all, a unrooted tree that is not a root yeah but that tree. doesn't change the number of dna differences that doesn't that doesn't change the data does it david can you actually show me a rooted tree no david i don't want you to slap and run i don't want to go and rabbit trail. <laughs> this right here shows a natural real quick this is a reflection okay don't, this don't is get off topic here this is not right. this is reflection. this is changing the topic dan SF2. dan dan you're just angry right now because your entire worldview is getting destroyed <laughs> why is there so few dna differences rooted that is not a rooted tree david Ooh, rooted I have the answer. doesn't change the number of differences on the on the tree does it if i were to root this does that change the number of differences here yes or no david uh pretty much yeah um no, it doesn't, it actually, it, it doesn't change the numbers. It doesn't change the numbers. An unrooted tree gives us a natural reading of the data. And the data here, okay, there's only, like I said, 22 differences on average separating any two people. And if you look at the longer lines, let's say the African branches, you'll find 100 max. Okay, this allows a substantial amount of purifying selection. The numbers that Dan keeps saying have not been done have been done by John Sanford and Rob Carter. So clearly he's not reading the relevant literature, okay? Dan is somebody who said, Carter knows nothing about mitochondrial DNA, showing me, proving me, to me, that he has never read that paper on hey, mitochondrial Can I get in for a second? Because, because we can solve this real quick. From Rob Carter. Okay, so either of you, answer the question. How do you account for this oh, being- I have an answer. Generation? I Go ahead, have man. an answer for you. I have an answer for you. And the answer is this. First, the relevant metric is the maximum number of differences, not the average, because what we're trying to calculate is how long it would take to accumulate the maximum divergence between the most divergent mitochondrial genomes. So that's first. The 22 average number is irrelevant. What matters is the maximum. No, it's relevant. No, it's not because yes, it's it about yeah. maximum I divergence. I even have a that's paper. I even have a paper, okay? But I've already screen shared enough papers. Enough, I think it's my turn. Wrong. I have a paper. Well, real quick, I'm going to say this. Oh, no, 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 not real quick. No, because no, you're not real quick. It's my turn. You Dan just spoke. It's my turn now. Turn now. No, because whoa, whoa, whoa. I have a paper. No, 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 no. No, SFT. All right, children. Um. I believe it is Dr. Dan's turn to speak. So go ahead and then going back and forth. The reason you use the maximum, not the average, is because you are calculating the time to most recent common ancestor for everyone, which means you are calculating the time for that it would take to accumulate the divergence between the most divergent genomes in your sample, which means the relevant question is how long would it take to accumulate in two separate mitochondrial genomes approximately 120 differences. That's first. Second, the reason, the reason that we see numbers that are lower than the mutation rate, than the, the actual like per replication mutation rate, is because we have mechanisms like selection, we have drift, we have bottlenecks that remove diversity from a population. So the vast majority of mutations that occur in a generation, right, you have a bunch of mutations in your germline. Most of those don't make it to the gametes. Most of the gametes don't make it to a, to a zygote. Most of the zygotes don't survive to adulthood, even the ones that do. The mutations found in those next generation adults, those mutations are weeded out over many generations. You need to account for that when you're calculating the time to most recent common ancestor. It isn't more complicated than that. And there's a simple way to address this question of do people like Jameson and Carter account for this? Standing just pulled up like five or six papers in a row. We could go through those and just control F, purifying selection, genetic drift. And we could just see, do they mention it? Do they account for it? That's easy to do. We could solve that in two minutes. And I know the answer because I've read those papers and I've gone through their math, Jameson and Carter, I've gone through their math. They don't account for anything beyond what they claim is a germline mutation rate. They don't account for things like selection and drift and, and bottlenecks and such. So 
I think we should pull up those papers. Standing, if you could just flash those titles, I can pull them up. Dave, you know, David can pull them up, and we can go through. And you don't have to stay if you don't want to, but we can go through and we can see if you know if those papers actually do deal with selection and drift and those other mechanisms that reduce diversity over generations. That's easy. That's an easy question yeah. to answer. Let's do By it. By the way, this is why Dr. Jameson does not want to show a rooted tree, because when you actually root this tree, where Dr. Jameson wants to root it, you get this. This is why Dr. Jameson does not want to root his tree. I, I, I'm just, uh, but I digress. Am I still muted, David? No, you're good. Um, okay, so I would just address the points like this. What I'll do is I've got about five, I've got about six papers, okay? Now that Put them in the private chat. We can pull them up. Up. No, I, I will. I just want to respond to the things before they leave me. So every, everything that he said, I understand. A lot of mutations get weeded out, okay, over, over many generations. I pointed out that the observed mutation rate is by definition faster than the long-term or substitution rate, okay? I, I think everybody agrees with this. And I agree with Dan. This is very simple. One thing, though, higher levels of genetic diversity does not necessarily mean age. And I've got a secular paper here that I'll also post uh, before I leave where it talks about population history as a factor, demographics. And even in the paper, they admit that climate and environmental conditions can change levels of genetic diversity that are not even related to the age of the population in terms of these Africans. OK, so, yes, mutations are weeded out over time. OK, but with such few DNA differences on average. This is simple. I agree with Dan, but I don't think he understands why it's simple. Okay. Thank you. With such few DNA differences on average that are separating any two people combined with a maximum of say a hundred. Okay. Which is still nothing compared to what the evolutionists need. When we look at these phylogenetic trees where the unrooted tree is the best way to look at the data because it gives us a natural reading of the data. It doesn't change the data itself. It doesn't change the numbers themselves which it seems you guys never want to deal with the numbers. I'm almost done real quick. You guys never want to deal with the numbers because even if we look at the maximum, which is 100, it's still too far away, okay? Even when we consider bottlenecks, even when we consider purifying selection, substitution rates, okay? You're still nowhere near where you need to be, okay, with your thousands of generations. All we see in terms of mitochondrial DNA phylogenetics and Y chromosome phylogenetics in light of the rate, in light of the DNA differences, Okay, in light of all this data, suggests we are only looking at a couple hundred generations worth of mutations and DNA differences over time. Jensen has made predictions based on his phylogenetic tree, based on his numbers. Okay, and contrary to what the the evolutionists say, he's not lying when he says that his predictions and his active research okay. program Real is quick. going nicely. So Real that's quick. the last thing I'll say. Real quick, has, these papers. has Dr. Jameson actually went out and tested that prediction? Which specific prediction? About the Khoisan peoples? A None any of them. them. <laughs> he hasn't tested that one, but he is, he's got an active research program uh, okay. right now well, um, testing the history okay. of civilization in terms of genetic uh, okay, markers so the of civilization. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so thank you for admitting that Jameson has not actually went out and tested that prediction. That because, specific uh, prediction he hasn't, but he's tested okay, yeah. numerous others. Okay, well, that specific What do you prediction. want him to do, fly over during lockdown? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, blood samples from Five years. People? It's been a long time since he made that prediction. Come on. It's been a long time yeah, since exactly. he made that prediction. By the way, hey, standing for truth. How long um, did it take for Charles Darwin when he made predictions for some of his predictions to either be verified or not verified? How long? Yeah. By, by the way, standing for truth, real quick, um, before we go off to that. Oh, there you go. Five years is not a long time. Yeah, yeah, by, no, by the way, we should stay with this because yeah, standing is for last math. Year mm -hmm. that. Sounds, sounds good. But real quick, standing for truth, before you go, um, how do you account? Put the papers in the private chat. You just yeah, ran put through them in the them. private chat. No, uh, I'm doing it right now, but you can go through No more questions then because I'm trying to get these into the. In okay. the chat. Or you can make a comment though. Give well, while you, well, while channel, you have, have some final words on what I just said. Uh, while you're putting the papers in the chat, fun. while you're putting the papers in the chat, let me just say that you know I've been asking for math for this for basically as long as I've been talking about it. All I want is to see somebody show me the math. Show me we got this many mutations per replication in the genome. We get this many mutations per gamete. We get this many mutations per zygote. We get this many mutations per offspring. We get this many mutations after five generations, after 10, after 100. All I want is for somebody to show me that math. And I, I am 
telling the truth when I tell you I read creationist literature probably more than I should. I've been through these papers. I can tell you I recognize the URLs that you're putting in the private chat. I know what these papers are. I've read them. None of them account for what I'm asking for. They are germline per generation mutation rates that are extrapolated back for however long. But you cannot extrapolate a per generation mutation rate because you have factors that decrease the, the rate of accumulation over multiple generations. And nothing, nothing that's here, and I mean, David, I don't know how much time you have, but if you want to go through some of these, we can just yeah, control all this. the way through them and see if they account for this stuff. Spoiler yeah, alert, they do not. Yeah, we can like, go It's not it. hard to do the math, and the creationists that are doing this are not doing the math. And I'm just like, I'm happy to wait, but don't expect me to take the creationist calculation seriously when they're just leaving out this whole giant set of mechanisms that reduce genetic diversity over generations. Hey, let so me let that's something that's not more complicated than that. And again, I just want to see numbers. I want to do calculations. I want to see math. Show me the math. Okay, so here, I'll, I'll say this then to respond to that, uh, since you brought up kind of a couple new points. So yes, you want the no, numbers. No, that was the same point. That was the same okay, point. Okay, I know you're excited, just real quick. I, on the spot, have already given obvious numbers that suggest the diversity, the overall diversity we see in terms of mitochondrial <laughs> DNA, even the Y chromosome, which we could talk about separately, are in line with only a couple hundred generations. We can see a reflection of this in the phylogenetic tree, which an unrooted tree, as I pointed out, gives us a natural reading of this data that we are talking about, okay? Free from assumptions and bias, okay? When considering these numbers, we are looking at, okay, and I'm gonna put this paper in the private chat too, uh, 0.5 per generation in terms of the mitochondrial DNA. Okay, it is it is fast. Yeah. Parsons himself told us if Doesn't he matter. redid the numbers, if he redid what he did years ago, he'd get the same thing. He's confident. He tells his critics to publish in peer-reviewed journals all the time, and they have it. Okay, so it only takes roughly 44 generations to account for the 22 differences on average between any two people. Okay. You've got 100 Plus, max. Because I have a I have even a specific question about that claim. Even considering the 100 max, Dan, you're still no specific claim. Here. Specific you have question about that claim. Dan, you haven't shown the number yes. that it requires. I had a lot of talks with people like CRISPR, who it's a lot of storytelling. It's a lot of assumptions on population sizes, population histories. In terms I have a question. of coming up with your numbers, how can you get thousands of generations out of the fact that mutation rates in mitochondrial DNA are 0.5 per answer. generation? On average, there's 22, okay, separating any two people. And yet Doesn't these matter. phylogenetic trees, you want to say, are a reflection of hundreds of thousands of years. I How have a question. How do you get to that? No, I have I a question. Show me the numbers. Show me the numbers on that. How I do you get already that? answered get that, that question. I already answered that question. And if you give me a minute, I'll pull up a paper that shows you that. But you just contradicted yourself. You said you have 0.5 mutations per generation. To, so to get your 20-ish mutations on average, you only need 40 generations. That assumes... That assumes that every germline mutation persists indefinitely within the population. Well, you missed but my point. Earlier, you're misrepresenting no, me. No, you're misrepresenting no, me. No, you, yes, you no, are. You, 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 you can well, continue, but now you're that. just now it's just okay, you're knocking down you. the problem so, and you're not responding to anything. Okay, so so here's what I'm at because this is what I'm asking for, standing, because you're saying I've got math, I'm giving you numbers, my math makes sense. You agreed, we all agreed that selection drift, all that stuff reduces the frequency of mutation fixation over time. We all agreed on that. So if you're saying the per generation rate is X, okay, you cannot just divide by X to get the number of generations you need to get a certain amount of accumulation because you get over 10 generations, you don't get 10X. Over 20 generations, you don't get 20X. Over 40 generations, you don't get 40X. It's less than that due to mutation selection in breeding, it's, or uh, selection, drift, bottlenecks, etc. It's less than that. So when you're saying we have our, our mutation rate of 0.5 mutations per generation, therefore it only takes 40 generations to get 20 differences. You're assuming in doing that math, you're just saying 0.5 times 40 generations equals 20. You're not accounting for the loss of diversity due to these factors that we all agreed on reduces diversity over generations. So what is the answer to that contradiction? Because in order to get the 6,000 year number, you, like Jensen doesn't do additional math in, in the, the 2015 thing with using Ding's data. He doesn't do additional math to account for that problem. He does the math like you just did the math. 
what about that stuff we agreed on that that reduces that rate? Can you explain that? Okay, so good good questions, good points. This is the way I like it, where we can just be more cordial, respectful. Okay, so yes, selection, drift, bottleneck, substitution rates. Okay, I've already pointed out that yes, the observed rate because of these things is by definition faster okay, then the long-term rate. Selection is going to weed out a lot of these mutations. A lot of new variants are lost over time. I agree with this. But my whole point in bringing up the 44 generations, okay, in being how long that would take given the, the 0.5 mutation rate in the mitochondrial DNA is simply showing that, hey, now we know that we have a couple hundred generations to account for unlimited purifying selection, to account for drift to account for substitution rates, to account for bottlenecks, because it only takes a minimal amount of generations to account for the average number of DNA differences separating any two people. So yes, the phylogenetics that we see in the reflection of the data, the reflection of the genetics, the reflection of the DNA differences really does best fit with a biblical based model of a couple hundred generations. You can't show me mathematically without assumptions on population histories, assumptions on population sizes. You can't show me, you can't provide me the exact numbers as to how this can ever be a reflection of thousands of generations. The numbers aren't there. It's far too few DNA differences in light of the fast mutation rate to ever result in a couple hundred thousand years worth of, of mitochondrial DNA history and Y chromosome history. So uh, go ahead. We, we can actually do that. That's, that's actually something that we have spent a lot of time doing, figuring out based on directly observed populations, what the, what the rate of accumulation is and what the strength of purifying selection is. We actually spend a lot of time figuring this out. And the way we calibrate this is based on direct observations where we know when two populations diverge from each other. So we fix that time to most recent common ancestor time Instead of calculating it, we fix it in the past because we know when the populations diverged. No assumptions necessary. We're talking about recorded human history here. And then we can document the, the rate of divergence in those two populations, and we can construct that curve that, that you know, per generation, five generations, 10 generations, you know, whatever, like you could construct that curve based on real data. We're not just inventing that curve right, out of nowhere. We actually directly observe the data that allow us to calculate that. So your, to your question of how do we account for so few mutations in so much time, the answer is drift, selection, bottlenecks, and population dynamics, as you say, because population size matters for things like strength of selection and the strength of genetic drift. So the answer is we've done that. We've done the math. It's in the literature. And you can find papers where they say, okay, we have this model. Now let's check it against known dates of divergence and see if it works. And wouldn't you know it, they, it works because you, you base it on observed data and then you calibrate it against observed data. And you can then make predictions about what you think other numbers should look like that you haven't checked yet. And lo and behold, you can get, you can make accurate predictions, validating those rates that give you a most recent common ancestor in the 100 to 200,000 year range. Yeah, by the way, okay, so, well, well, these... David, let, let me just respond to that just so he could brought up another couple points. So what I would say, and I appreciate your response there, Dan. Okay, so the rate of divergence and the substitution rates that you're talking about here require essentially unknowable assumptions on population numbers and population history. That's a fact. I no, don't agree no, with no, you. No. Oh, real quick, I'm, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I don't agree, and I know you don't agree, so you can have a response after this. I don't agree that the math has been done, okay? A lot of, I'm sure a lot of unjustifiable calibrating in terms of the data in light of evolutionary base history and retrofitting of this data in terms of the levels of genetic diversity that were not predicted by the evolutionary community in the mitochondrial DNA and in light of the fast mutation rate. You are saying that you're making predictions based on these uh, known divergences in human history. Okay, right, but just, like I've said, and I've seen you admit that there are uh, some assumptions involved in that. And contrary to what the evolutionists want to admit, Dr. Jensen has, okay, it is a fact, he has an active research program where he is looking at the stamp of human civilization, okay, using genetic markers, he's looking at the transatlantic slave trade, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, uh, Genghis Khan's empire. He is looking for genetic signatures versus noise in the phylogenetics of mitochondrial DNA if this really is only a reflection of a couple hundred 
years. And the evolutionary community can certainly do the same, but I understand that the evolutionary community expects more noise since this would then be thousands of generations worth of human history. Go ahead, I yield. Sure, so standing for truth, here's a couple of questions for you. Um, what evolutionary assumptions are being made? Number two, in your own words, can you explain why those, are, why those assumptions are being made? And finally, why are those assumptions invalid? Sure, so they will assume okay, that the reflection of these DNA differences in terms of the phylogenetic tree and trees that are derived, depending on the DNA compartment you're looking at, they are assuming that this is a reflection of hundreds of thousands of years and not just four to 6,000 years. They're making assumptions on population history, population sizes, okay, in terms of the divergence events that Dan is talking about, they oftentimes assume the chimp to human split in order to compare the amount of DNA differences. I understand they don't always do this depending on the outgroup um, and depending on the root, but essentially they still do the bigger picture. They assume that split. They look at the number of DNA differences separating humans and chimps, and then they come up with a mutation rate that's a lot slower than what we see today. My whole point is, this is what I'll say, and to be fair, I'll, I'll let Dan respond because I think he was going to say something and then you jumped in there. My point is, hey, listen, we only see a few DNA differences, okay, that separate any two people. The mutation rate's fast, roughly 0.5 per generation, okay? So that means if it only takes roughly 40 to 50 generations to accumulate those, now, since we understand that the rate that we observe is faster than the long-term rate, okay, we can now account for the things that we should be accounting for that Dr. Dan rightly points out. You know, he's an intelligent guy. I, I understand that. I've learned a lot from him. He points out selection, drift, bottleneck, substitution rates. I might be missing something there at the top of my head. And I think that can be accounted for because we have a couple hundred generations where we can just invoke substantial amount of purifying selection. I mean, Dan, are you saying that 99% of new mutations are weeded out? Because the numbers are yes. so low, I mean, absolutely. Yes. Yes. The vast majority fail to reach fixation, and typically the substitution rate is one to two orders of magnitude slower than the mutation rate. Yeah, and this is, of course, because most um, mutations, um, uh, of course, not every zyg most zygotes don't really live to become adults and reproduce. And yeah, it's it's. I actually, it's really um, that simple. Here, I have. Um, so the the rates for for double stranded DNA organisms, the rates for uh, mutation rates. This is um, per site per replication mutation rates are in the neighborhood of ten to the seventh, ten to the negative eight. Sorry, I'm looking at viruses. So for cellular, it's about ten to the minus ninth, ten to the minus tenth. Um, and um, like bacteria are actually the best at this. They're like 10 to the minus 10th. The substitution rates, the, the, acu the fraction of those that accumulate are orders of magnitude slower than that. They're really, really slow. And it's because the vast majority of mutations that occur in, for example, a multicellular animal are not germline. The vast majority of germline mutations don't get into gametes. The vast majority, or don't get into uh, gametes. The vast majority of, of mutations in gametes don't get into a zygote. Most zygotes don't survive to adulthood. Even if you survive to adulthood, the likelihood of your lineage persisting over one, over five, over 10, over 100, over 1,000 generations declines. So there's there's many, many, many layers of this weeding out. And you can actually see this. Uh, this is the relevant figure right here. This curve is, this should look familiar to people. When we talk about this stuff, this is the relevant curve for the uh, mutation rate. And what you can see is this is the uh, x-axis here is ages. KYA is 1,000 years ago. And uh, on the y-axis, we have mutation rate. And you can see it starts off high, and then it drops down. And the reason it drops down are these things we're talking about. And you'll note that that y-axis is a... Uh, no, it's not a log scale. It's uh, it's time three, two and a half, two, one point five, one times ten to the. I honestly can't read that because it's too small. Um, what I want to show you in this paper is that that figure is not um, just one. It's not just assumed, and two, it's not based on uh, the human chimp divergence, which is often what creationists say. There's this whole section on cross checking where they're basing it on events that we can we can actually document in other ways. 
And so you have the out of Africa dispersal, that's fine. You can have the settlement of Europe very well documented about 45,000 years ago. What I want to focus on are the more recent ones, island colonizations, because this is in recorded human history. So Canary Islands, right there, 2.2 to 2.4 thousand years ago. I think they discuss uh, up here is Vanuatu, which was three, here we go, about 3.2 thousand years ago, right? These are uh, events that are within recorded human history. You could do the same thing for New Zealand, for Madagascar, for even for Iceland, which was only settled about a thousand years ago. And you can go through this paper and you can see that the predictions match. We say we have this rate based on whatever. We predict what we should see for these known events. And then we can actually go and see, does it match? And the answer is yes. Validating this rate. That's the answer. We have data that, that would only match if the time to most recent common ancestor that's calculated correctly, that is giving us a number of one to 200,000 years ago, we have predictions based on that that would only be correct if that was right. If the mutation rate is as fast as creationists claim it would be, these predictions would be off, not by a little bit. They'd be, they wouldn't be off by 500 or 1,000 years. They'd be off by an order of magnitude. Okay, so uh, good points. I, I appreciate what you're saying, and I appreciate the uh, the numbers and predictions that that you're providing. I think this is a good conversation to go right back to. I think one of the first things you said, um, in terms of answering my question, uh, you said that 99% of the mutations would then have to be filtered out in in light of the numbers and the data that we have. To me, that seems like a stretch in order to fit the data, but you did you did provide some numbers and predictions. Okay, so we can't gloss over that. Now I will say, I will say that mutations in mitochondrial DNA, since mitochondrial DNA codes for some pretty essential and important functions to to life. So you know, obviously mutations will be removed. The question is how many? That's why I think it does come come down to predictions, and that's why I also appreciate that Dan is always willing to provide some type of predictions that more or less doesn't really assume the champ human split because he's looking at known historical accounts in terms of, of divergence. But it still comes down to whether or not these predictions have been verified, how many assumptions they're based on, okay? Because we need to look at how much purifying selection is acting upon specifically in terms of this conversation, how much natural selection is acting upon human populations in terms of weeding out these mutations. Like I said, the 99% seems like kind of a stretch in order to explain the what, the fast rate in light of the very few differences, I, can I just can I just jump in for can I just jump in for a second because this is this is um, a surprising sticking point. I'll, I'll put my screen away. Um, uh, we don't have that up anymore. Um, this is a surprising sticking point for me because this is not um, controversial at all. The the substitution rates, the rate at which mutations accumulate, is so 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 much slower than the mutation rates. It's I mean again we're not talking. 50% or 20%, we're talking an order of magnitude, at least. And that gets worse when you're talking about something multicellular because you have so many levels of filtration where mutations are weeded out. Um, it's just, I mean, to say it's 99% of mutations never fix in the population is not, that's conservative. It's probably 99.99 something mutations never fix. It's, I mean, yeah, it's, a, it's the vast majority don't fix. Um, so, so I'll say this based on, in good points there, um, what I was saying earlier is what we do see though, in terms of just there being a few differences and in light of, yes, the substitution rate, as you're saying, is, uh, what did you say? You said it's, it's a lot slower than the observed mutation rate, not 20% in terms of purifying selection, not 50%. I would agree that that's kind of low. Okay. And I understand this because like you said, on so many levels in terms of filtration, you know, there's so many levels that mutations can be weeded out and, and you've gone over a, no, a number of them in terms of like the zygote. Um, but the 99% still has to, cause you're looking at um, island colonizations. Some of them. Yeah, you know, some, yeah. On the Canary Islands, right? I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Now, 
you know, this is still making some type of assumptions based on at least population numbers and some of the more minutia, you know, if, if we go down in, into the more minute details. I mean, it's recorded history, 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 their demographics, it's recorded history, but is the exact population numbers, the exact details. I mean, we know, it's, we know within an order of magnitude what the population is. We know it's, we know it wasn't, you know, 10 and we know it wasn't 10 million. We know, you know, within a range what that population is. I mean, for Polynesian settlements, it's really easy. And a number of these, these calibration points involve Polynesian settlements. It's really easy uh, because the islands are only so big. You can't support that many people. We know approximately what the maximum sustainable size is. So if you want to be conservative, you just assume on one end of your range, the maximum sustainable population, and you assume on the other side of your range, the minimum viable population. There's your range. It's not that big a range. What about, okay, but now I understand, okay, because you don't say a lot that I necessarily disagree with in terms of the science of all this, right? That's why I oftentimes will reiterate what you're saying, because what you're saying is correct. It's true, you know, and when it comes to the fixation rates being slow, isn't that because the fixation of substitutions in a population of billions of people, that is extremely slow. But if we're looking at our model, it's slow now. Okay. But if we're talking about the past, let's say the flood event, you know, with just eight people and then the tower of Babel event with, with say a thousand people. Well, for those two bottleneck events, aren't we looking at rapid substitution rates, faster substitution rates than we'd see now in terms of the population of 7 billion, which would then account for even better the average number of DNA differences that separate any two people, which is 22, and then the 100 max. What, what are your thoughts on that, Dan? The reason, so two things. One, the reason that that is wrong is that you take a biblical bottleneck, right? at some point in the past, what a bottleneck does is it fixes a small fraction of the diversity in a population and it wipes out the rest, right? So the, the, the situation you get is instead of seeing, and we can see this in, in, our, in our population as it, as it diverges, you can see these events, these, these bottleneck events, because what you see is uh, in the parent populations, you see, a, you see more diversity, and then you go through a bottleneck and you can see what subset of that diversity persists through that, that founder event or that bottleneck. Now, what you're saying is, doesn't that account for a more rapid rate of fixation? No, because necessarily only a few people make it through those bottleneck events, right? The flood only had eight human genomes make it through. So you're going to zero out a lot of diversity that reduces the fixation rate because a lot of the variation that had previously existed in the human population gets wiped out. So those events, by removing a bunch of variants from the population, reduce the rate over time. They don't by accelerate the way, it. By the way, real quick, um, someone brought up a really good point in the comment section. Um, I actually did an Ancestry.com test and they were actually able to tell me exactly where my family came from and not only that, where my family settled in the United States and exactly when they were able to come to the United States. I actually, I think I might point that out, um, pull up my own Ancestry study just because... I will, I will say there are some problems with the methodology things like that use, but it's it's like 90% good and 10% a little a little over... They get out ahead of their skis a little bit. Yeah. But it's for the most part. Oh, but so, way, so the it, second thing, actually. Okay, but let me. Oh, oh, okay, continue. Well, because yeah, I, I, I had because I had two things there. So the first thing was was the bottleneck thing that that it does the opposite of what you said. The second thing though is that you're agreeing with with this idea that we have you know mechanisms that reduce diversity over generations, right? They they slow the rate at which mutations reach fixation within a population. So that rate of fixation is a lot lower than the rate at which mutations occur, right? So we agree on that stuff. What I've been asking for and what I have not seen in, and what, what surprises me is this was not in your response to this because the, the simple answer to my objection here is to just show Here's where Dr. Carter accounts for this. Here's the equation where he does the math, and this factor right here is selection. And they have a range of strength of selection, and that accounts for this problem. Or if Jensen does the same thing, he doesn't. Like, they, none of them do. But what, what 
I'm asking for is to show if the creation model, you know, accounts for that, just show the math, show the equation. In the paper I just showed, if people were watching as I was scrolling, um, there were equations in there. There were equations in there. And they could put in different factors based on observations and, and solve the equation. I'm looking for the same from the creation scientists, from the people who are saying, no, trust us, these numbers check out, here's the math. I'm looking for the math. And I, like I've said, I've gone through their papers. They don't account for selection. They don't account for drift. They don't, they don't account for these factors. They don't even account for things like the, like the, uh, um, the germline to gamete bottleneck, which you have to account for. Most germline cells in the human body never become gametes. Like you have to account for that. So you can't just use a germline rate and assume all those things, forget 10 generations on, you can't even assume all those things make it into sperm and egg cells. Like I wanna see the math where creationists account for those, those problems. Okay, let me go right back. And, and, and like I said, more good points. I appreciate this conversation. Uh, back to one of the first thing you said minutes ago, um, just to stay on track and work our way to where you, uh, you, what you're saying now, these bottleneck events, the effects, okay? Uh, you're saying we see examples today, we can see the parent populations, okay? We see more diversity than we see the bottleneck occurring in where we can now look at the subset of diversity persisting in essentially the daughter populations. Um, you're correct. Eight, so eight human genomes make it through in the biblical bottleneck at the flood. We, we zero much of the diversity, I think is what you said. But with the fact that these bottlenecks, okay, being according to our model, one generation and let me finish my thoughts here and then and make your point. One generation then followed by rapid and exponential population growth, would that not lead to faster rates at least, at least temporarily as compared to a more extended population bottleneck, okay, that we see in terms of bottlenecks invoked by the evolutionary uh, community and, and their models, but also if mutation rate is fast, okay, I'm talking about the observed rate, the pedigree rate, okay, this should then mean that fixation is reached much quicker in smaller populations. Our model would then say that all of the fixation or the majority of the fixation, okay, and we only see a, a few differences in terms of, of fixation rates. Fixation just means to get stuck for people who don't understand it, you know, stuck in place in terms of DNA differences. This would have occurred early in our model around the two bottlenecks, right? Around the flood bottleneck and around the Tower of Babel. Do you think, are you kind of being difficult, Dan? I mean, I, I don't really see where there's an issue well, here. I, I'll, give you, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the answer because the answer is this. The bottlenecks depend, so the loss of diversity through a bottleneck depends on two things. It depends, as you said, on the length of the bottleneck, right? So if you get a longer time period with small population, then that's going to be worse than a short bottleneck with, with a small population. But the other thing that's relevant is the effective population size, right? How right. big genetically? Because it's it's not the, it, so it's it's N sub E is the effective population size. And that's basically how much, it's, it's kind of a measure of how much like genetic diversity is there in a population. How many individuals do you need to account for all of the diversity in a population? And so you can have uh, a short bottleneck like the flood bottleneck would be but if you have an effective population size in the single digits then then you lose you zero out all that other diversity because you have a maximum number of alleles in that population especially considering the fact that you don't even get the benefits of all eight people what you're actually getting is at most uh 10 alleles per locus right you get noah and his wife and their alleles are gonna be in some combination in their sons, and then you have the three wives. And that's all you get, that's it. So if we're being super generous and assume a completely unrealistic rate of recombination, you could account for 12 alleles per locus, and then you need whatever rates of diversification from there going forward, all right? That's the first problem. So it's, an, it's not just the length of the bottleneck, it's the effective population size, and when you go through a bottleneck in the single digits like that, you it doesn't matter that it's one generation. You're, you're fixing tons of genetic diversity in that situation. 
the set and by fixing tons of genetic diversity, what I mean is you are you are removing a bunch of alleles and fixing a bunch of different loci within the population, meaning going forward, there's no variation in those sites and you need mutations to generate any new variants. The second problem is that this argument that you you kind of z you zero it out at the flood and then go from there, that contradicts, and I know this is getting off topic, so we don't have to go down this road if, if you and David don't want to, but this now contradicts the idea of created heterozygosity, which necessitates rapid rates of recombination, rates in excess of what we observe. If we're going with what we're talking about right here with a small effective population size and we're fixing a lot of alleles, well, now it doesn't matter how much you recombine because if those alleles are fixed, everybody has the same one. And now we're contradicting what Jensen says about most of the diversity that we have right now being present through created heterozygosity. He says 99 point something percent. Well, if we're zeroing out a bunch of that diversity during the various bottlenecks, then that causes a problem for us because now we have to recreate that diversity, not through recombination because you have two alleles that are the same. You could recombine all day long, you don't get anything new, but you have to recreate that diversity through mutation, which then gets us back to the problem we're talking about. And that's why it's relevant that most mutations that occur don't persist. So those are two related points that are problems with what you just said. It's, it's, it's the effective population size and also that your argument in this case contradicts your argument with created heterozygosity. Um, okay, so which I recognize as a side thing that's not really yeah, a topic. Yeah. And, and I, I missed some things that you said at the end there in terms of writing down what you said, but I think I got most of what you said at the beginning, but I'll try and address what you said there on um, design diversity created heterozygosity because you made some good points there. So I'll try and touch on it all. Um, so I, I don't see how, and this is going back to what you said at the beginning. So at first it's going to seem like I'm not responding to the design diversity, but I don't see how the rate of substitution has to change as in, it, it doesn't have to be different than it is today. It just means that in light of everything we're talking about here, it just means that reaching fixation in the smaller population, okay, according to our model, was much easier than it is today with what, seven to eight billion people on the planet. Now, as far as I know, no evolutionary bottleneck model uh, being suggested ever has had an effective population size of eight. Combined with, I'll just bring this in then since you've, you've talked about it, combined with our starting position, I should say original starting position, uh, front-loaded created nuclear heterozygosity, okay? When we consider the, based on what you were saying, when we can, I don't see a problem because when we consider the genomic position definition of allele, and I know you've heard me say this before, but this is why I don't see a problem because when I consider this, we understand that there are, millions of DNA positions in the genome. No one's going to disagree yeah. with that. Therefore, to me, real, real quick, I'll, I'll be done soon, David. He, he said a lot there. I want to see if I can get it all. Um, and I don't want to ruin your show too, since we've been going at it for an hour here. But here, here's the thing. Therefore, the potential, in light of this, the potential given the position uh, definition of allele and given the original starting point of design diversity, the potential for change, variation, adaptation, okay, et cetera, is essentially unlimited. And this goes back to, I mean, I like how Dan likes to keep it simple because in simple terms, this just goes back to the idea of what? Capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b. So if originally Adam and Eve were created genetically heterozygous at these locations, but we apply yeah. this to the millions of positions in the okay. genome. Yeah, standing for truth. S sorry, sorry. Yeah, David, you're making me lose my train of thought. Dan said a lot there. What's going on? I'm sorry. Um, I do want to say thank you guys both for a very respectful, cordial conversation. Thank you both for coming in. Oh, yeah. Um, no, my, my pleasure. I, my wife came down, and I, I just waved her away, and, and she said, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm real quick for you, Standing for Truth. I have a quick um, pop quiz for you. So in a pop, if we have two individuals. Well, let me just finish these thoughts, let me, let me, and, and then okay. give me the pop quiz, and then give me the pop quiz. So in light of everything I'm saying, Okay, in light of the genomic uh, position definition of allele, okay, combined with uh, the mechanisms for change that Dan kind of touched upon in terms of gene conversion, recombination, um, 
and these design variants. Okay, yeah, we would assume that these design variants, obviously from the starting position of God, would have placed them in functional and beneficial linkage blocks. Okay, I've made this joke before. I know it's kind of tongue in cheek, but let's say the created heterozygosity, say you start with that model. It'd be pretty silly if God, through his foreknowledge, this is just bad theology. I think good theology is good. What did he say? Oops, you know, I, I, I forgot to put these design variants in positions in the genome that could actually recombine in the first place or can be subject to good helpful gene conversion. To me, that's just silly, but that's from my starting position, I guess, okay? So here's the thing. Also more functioning enzymes, beneficial to recombination and gene conversion, I personally see, and I'll end it here, no problem as long as we what? Properly define the, the word allele, and as long as we acknowledge that, although Adam and Eve would have had what? Two sets of chromosomes each, within those chromosome pairs, are millions of DNA differences that can recombine okay. and be subject to gene conversion and mutation and lead to all sorts of variations. All okay, so, uh, so standing for a quick pop quiz for you. Um, two people, let's say Adam and Eve, how many allele differences can exist between the two of them for any given street? I think I just touched on this. What's your definition of allele, David? Um, pretty much just that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, um, why? What, what's your definition of allele? So, um, yeah. So here, like, well, don't Google it. I mean, you're yeah, giving me the question. I, I'm talking about um, when we do a Punnett square, that type of stuff. Um, yeah. How many for, for any different traits? Um, what is the maximum number of um, differences that can exist between them? Well, that's why we need to. And I just spent five minutes talking about it. That's why we need to be on the same page in terms of uh, definition of, is your definition of allele a genetic variant? Yes, that's pretty much it. The um, I I Exactly that, and a variant, an uh, um, alternative form of a gene. So, um, okay, but at a, at a specific genetic loci, specific genetic location? Like a specific trait. So for blue eyes, brown eyes, two people have a maximum allele for differences of four, correct? Sure. Okay, so here's here's the problem. You're not going to be able to have enough time to generate all the genetic diversity when you count for the uh, for, for both the um, severe. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but David, you're just talking about because and and I guess just to repeat myself, so we're on the same page. Yes. It goes back to this whole capital A. If you're a capital A, capital A, capital B, capital B, you're genetically homozygous. Okay, right. for that trait. Okay, but if you're capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b, okay, you're genetically heterozygous. But there's millions of places in the genome. <laughs> so that means okay, so, you can um, be genetically heterozygous at millions of locations in the genome. Okay, so there okay, can is I, can unlimited I, potential for genetic. Can variation. I jump in here? Can I jump in here for a second? Because that's just simply not true. Even if you have two loci, two alleles for the same gene, now they could be different at one nucleotide, they could be different at a thousand nucleotides. The thing that limits how much variation, how many different alleles you can get over time for that gene is the rate of recombination between those alleles. And the rate of recombination in humans is approximately one crossover per chromosome per meiosis. That's the rate that is observed. And no one's suggesting that's going to change. Maybe creationists do, but Jensen doesn't, Carter doesn't, and any of their papers on created heterozygosity. Nobody's suggesting that rate changes, which means you, we can actually do the math on this one. And again, happy to go through the math. It's really straightforward. Uh, a great example is the ABO blood group, which has over a thousand distinct alleles. And we could see how many, so you need approximately, it's well over a thousand, but we can round down to be nice and say a thousand. Okay, you need a thousand recombination events to get those different alleles from the original four, because it's over a thousand, let's round down and say a thousand. Well, they, that gene makes up about one five thousandth of the chromosome on which it is located. So in order to accumulate those 1,000 crossover events within that gene, you need about five million crossover, event, crossover events on that chromosome alone, which means you need about five million generations. No, not, that doesn't have to be linear. It doesn't have to be all in one, uh, one lineage, right? You have divergence, right? And you have lots of lineages. But we could actually calculate how many lineages you would need and how much time and blah, 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 blah. We can do the math. I've done the math on that. And it does not work in any way, no matter how you slice it, with young Earth requirements. 
And those numbers are overly generous because most of the recombination that happens within the gene happens within the introns. But we need, in order to generate all those variants, recombination within the teensy tiny little exons. You need recombination repeatedly in slightly different places in a very small fraction. So it's the you could you could play with those numbers however you want. There's no way to make it work to get the number of variants via recombination given 6,000 years and young Earth population sizes, no matter how different those well, let me numbers are. Okay, so okay. so well, hey, real quick, real quick, because I need to address, because I feel like too many points are now being, being thrown around. So let me address that real quick. Okay, so the rate of recombination, the rate, okay, so the rate of recombination, yes, it's, it's about one crossover per chromosome per meiosis, okay? Uh, now, when it comes to the rate of gene conversion, gene conversion by definition can help break out these DNA variants. I will say that, okay? Now, the rate of, of these uh, uh, mm, 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 no, 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 because it can't, because it, it copy and paste from an existing one. So gene conversion doesn't help you because it copy paste from an existing one. It's conversion. So you're taking something that already exists and copying that over a different thing that already exists. So gene conversion doesn't help you. I, I would disagree. I think it does help me. I think that's, I mean, that's what the mechanism is. That's what Dan, please, I, I haven't interrupted you. I, if we're going to interrupt each other every time we disagree with a point, then it's just going to be nothing but interruption. And I would have interrupted you 50 well, times. Okay, you know, so let me continue on that. Well, say the things. rate of gene. All right. I'm going to mute you guys real quick. Um, standing for truth, it's your turn. Okay. I appreciate it. Am I muted? Yeah, you're, you're good. Okay. I'm using a new mic, David. Is it coming in okay? Your mic is perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, so what I'll say, I lost my train of thought there, at least the effectiveness of these variation inducing mechanisms like gene conversion, recombination, okay? And they're still doing a lot of study on gene conversion. It's not like they know these mechanisms perfectly. But what I'll say is they would have, at least according to our model, okay, and not the straw man version of it, they would have been far better, far more beneficial, far more effective in the past, okay? This goes all in line with genetic entropy, which is probably another topic for another day. But overall, when it comes to recombination and gene conversion, okay? What we see in terms of linkage blocks, once again, this goes back to the bigger picture. Like with the mitochondrial DNA differences, okay, when you're looking at the 0.5 per generation, there's only a few DNA differences that separate any two people, okay? Well, that's the bigger picture there. Now we're looking at the bigger picture here because Dan brought up this topic. Well, it, in terms of linkage blocks, what we see is the actual existence of the original text strings of Adam and Eve. We see, we see very, um, we see linkage blocks, okay, large linkage blocks that have almost no evidence that they were ever recombined, they were ever shuffled. If we've actually been evolving for millions of years and we've been experiencing generations and generations of recombination and gene conversion, okay, every single generation essentially, like uh, Dan was saying, one crossover per chromosome per meiosis, at least with recombination, not sure what the gene conversion rate is, but uh, I do have it in, in my notes somewhere, I can look at it later, but we would expect, according to the evolutionary model, that the genomes would be completely scrambled and shuffled, and yet we don't see that at all. And I understand the evolutionists look to hot and cold spots in the genome in terms of recombination and gene conversion, but once again, we look at the bigger picture, and it fits perfectly with the biblical-based model, okay? We can still say, like, let's say with the mutation rates, we can still say, hey, listen, we're looking at you know, maybe 75% purifying selection versus the evolutionist who has to say 99.9% .9 just to make the numbers fit. Okay, point is what we see in terms of the macro scale, the macro view on every topic that Dan brings up is perfectly in line with the biblical based model. Very little evidence of recombination and gene conversion. Anyways, we can see these massive linkage blocks that still exist in our genomes, pointing us right back to the first couple, Adam and Eve. Go ahead, I yield. Um, so one issue with the whole creative heterozygosity and all of that is um, the issue of inbreeding. And the issue of inbreeding would be um, all of that genetic diversity will eventually be lost because we know that inbreeding creates homozygosity, not heterozygosity, not rapid mutation. Um, it would be um, much more, um, pretty much everything would be. Um, severely inbred um, and even lower diversity than we have today, you're not going to be able to get the 1,000 plus cellular diversity um, that we see in the ABO blood group if everything is severely inbred. And we um, contest that hypothesis. Um, so the hypothesis is that um, inbreeding um, increases 
uh, mutation, we can look at populations such as Gina that are um, highly inbred, and we can see that they are not hypermutating, and thus um, the hypermutation hypothesis is refuted. So go ahead, um, Dr. Dan, Sandy, if you want to add anything on that. Well, let me address that, and then I'll address that because, uh, David, we've had like an entire two hour debate on this. So, in a nutshell, I'll give my response. And then, what I'm going to do um, is, is let you guys have the last word, and then, and then I'm going to get out of here. I got to prepare for a debate on Sunday, and this has been a good conversation. But because it's been a good conversation, I do want to give you guys the last word on it. Okay. So, I'll say this. Okay, when it comes to the bottlenecks, when it comes to the low genetic diversity that we essentially should see, well, we see the low genetic diversity in all animals in the mitochondrial DNA in terms of what? The CO1 gene, that highly, highly conserved mitochondrial DNA gene that we can look at, okay, in that recent study, which we've all talked about, that is a direct reflection of the, the flood bottleneck. 90% of all species came into existence at the exact same time. Humans have incredibly low genetic diversity. Okay, far less than animals. Some chimpanzees within themselves have more diversity than humans and Neanderthals. Okay, and remember, humans, according to our model, they congregated where? At Babel, in say a population of 10, while all the other animals spread out across the earth. Okay, it was humans that did not listen to God. So essentially, they have a now another genetic diversity reducing event somewhat of another bottleneck at Babel. So that's exactly what we see, animals versus humans, exactly what we would expect. When it comes to the inbreeding though, if you start from the design diversity hypothesis, well, you're not starting with any mutations. Every single bottleneck in the biblical model in terms of at least the creation event and the flood event was one generation followed by rapid and exponential population growth. I talked about how uh, there's roughly about 10 million common variants, a lot of rare variants, but common variants around the globe. Okay, we alone have 3 billion or 3 million differences in us. That's why we can have essentially unlimited children if it were possible, and every children would be different. We are heterozygous, right? So if you take those common variants, let's say 10 million, place them into uh, the people, the genomes uh, at the flood, and Adam and Eve would have really only need 20. They can lose half and boom, all your uh, diversity add in mutations over time. will explain exactly what we see, not to mention mutational hotspots, not to mention uh, genetic sequences and locations that appear to be designed through environmental changes. I mean, epigenetics is a huge factor. They seem to be designed and mutate in the first place. So all of your rare variants are perfectly explained, not to mention we can look to allele frequencies around the globe, rare, not so rare. We can look at Y chromosome, geographically specific Y chromosome, all consistent with Babel. We can literally see Babel in our genetics. So everything you're saying, uh, David, to me seems to be a straw man and a misunderstanding of the biblical model. And we have evidence to support everything that you say there is no evidence for. I yield. Have the last word, gentlemen. Uh, so it doesn't look like I'm getting out of here. Right. Roughly, and then I'm well, gonna, uh, um, real quick. Um, thank you guys um, both for coming in here, and thank you guys both for a very respectful and very enjoyable conversation, Doctor Dan. Thank you, and Sandy Quatru. Thank you for. Hey, David. Um, can I just get Can I just get one thing in before we go here? Because there's there's as as you all were just talking, then I went through all the links that SFT provided to us and looked for mentions of selection in those papers from Carter and whoever else is in there. There's um, CMI, ICR, proceedings of whatever creation conference, and I did it on screen. I was doing the control F on screen, and none of those papers even mentioned purifying selection. A few of them actually mentioned saying, you know, there are other things like selection drift that we have to like, that we maybe have to consider and you have to think about that. But then none of them actually like do account for it. Um, they just don't, uh, it's just not in any of those papers. And the second thing, what um, Standing just said about all animals having a bottleneck, um, the the work on that, the the I think he's referring to the, the bottleneck um, that came out a few years ago. There was a paper that had to do with like DNA barcoding, I think, and it showed that there were uh, bottlenecks across lots of different types of animals. The thing that we're leaving out there is that the timing of those bottlenecks varied by tens of thousands of years across the different groups of animals, and they were all... I forget the range, but it was 60, 80, 100, 150,000 years ago. It was a big old range starting way outside the young earth timeline. So that those data don't help. That's all I got. That's all. But the big thing is just, I went through those papers that standing said, here's where the answers are to my questions about drift and selection and such. And I went through those papers and the answers are not there. I did it on screen. Everybody could see it. And I was saying in the chat, how many mentions there were in each one. The answers yeah. aren't there. 
It's yeah. that simple. They don't count for it. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, you, yeah, no, hey, like I said, you can have the last words. Obviously, we can continue this on forever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'm going to be respectful and, and give you guys the last words. I think that was a good discussion. Uh, I don't, you know, I'm, uh, I'll go and say that I don't believe you guys have answered the arguments or the bigger picture, and I don't think you ever will. But that's fine. You know, I don't expect you guys <laughs> to tap out. Uh, just keep studying, and, and one day you'll be biblical uh, creationists like myself and Rob Matt and uh, the others that you know hold empirical science to such high value and standards. So I appreciate it, gentlemen. 